Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,171. Working this hard is a sure death, but it's a slower death than starvation, and it's a lot more fun. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest, Jim Hinckley. Hey, Jimmy, you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Oh, I enjoy a fun ride. All right, here we go. Jim Hinckley is an automotive journalist, an author, a speaker, and the development consultant at Jim Hinckley's America brand. He's the former associate editor for Cars and Parts, and he has published feature articles for Hemmings Classic and Special Interest Auto. Classic Auto Restorer, Old Cars Weekly, as well as 19 automotive books. His published automotive works are focused on the American auto industry between 1885 and 1945, and he has made presentations on numerous topics in the early automotive road, highways, and evolution of Route 66 here in the USA. Jim's work has been the subject of interviews on a variety of programs, and you've probably seen him on Jay Leno's Garage and Travel with Rick Steves. So, Jim, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment to share a little more about your career and your passion for automobiles? Sure. My quest to become a writer when I grow up has continued. I'm now into my 60s, and I'm hoping to complete that goal sometime in the near future. <laughs> Do you uh, mean to grow up? <laughs> my, yes. My love for old cars, I you know, that, that uh, predates, gosh, I don't even know where it begins. But I've always had a fascination with vehicles especially older than I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've always had a love for the vehicles back in the teens, the 20s, and 30s. I mentioned in your intro, uh, you are really focused in on the American auto industry between 1885 and 1945. And you think about 1885, whoa, were there any cars back in 1885? You know, that was the the beginnings. We had people like Ransom E. Olds that were tinkering with steam engines and uh, automotive technology and giving interviews for magazines about 1889 about the future of what would become the automobile. And, of course, we had the Duryea brothers commencing production with their automobiles in the mid-1890s. Uh, Barnum & Bailey Circus gave top billing to a Duryea motor wagon over the albino and the fat lady at the circus. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, the future was coming, and uh, I think we're living in a pretty cool time right now because... We see a major transition happening in the auto industry. Does that have you excited with what's happening with autonomous cars, electric cars? I mean, some of these things that are coming down the road very, very fast. I find this probably one of the most fascinating periods in automotive history. It's an extremely interesting time period. I'm I'm technologically challenged. It doesn't mean I'm not intrigued by the new cars. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had the privilege recently of traveling in a 1915 Ford through the mountains of Arizona, and the following week to do so in a Tesla. It was wow. quite a comparative study. Oh, gosh. You know, I, I'm chuckling because uh, I got invited to be a keynote speaker and a guest at the Ironstone Concord this past summer. And it was a really wonderful Concord. It takes place in Murphy's, California, and it's beautiful country there. And I got to ride along in a 1916 race car, indie race car, for about a two-hour drive. And you're right. I mean, wow. You think back to cars back in that era and how challenging it was to drive in those. And then my drive back was in a 1958 Oscar. So I moved my, my style very fast, very forward. We got back in half the time that it took us to get there. Actually, it was less in that Oscar because the gentleman driving, oh my gosh, he knew how to drive. But then to move into a Tesla and a modern car, which the next day I drove back to the airport to fly home, it was really, yeah, for me, a wonderful experience to go, man, let's think of the evolution here of what's happened. Well, we're going to learn a lot more about all these things you know as we continue on your journey. But first, I like to ask my guests for a success quote or a mantra. This is a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? So, Jim, take the wheel. Well, it's a simple philosophy that I have. Being an automotive writer, a journalist, a writer of any kind is a difficult challenge. And as an old boy told me once, working this hard is a sure death, but it's a slower death than starvation, and it's a lot more fun. <laughs> I love that. 
Well, how have you evolved that into your career over time? Because I think a young man would hear that and go, oh, I think I better go do something else. But you're really passionate about cars, aren't you? Yeah, I always have been. I've tried a lot of different, uh, I've had a very odd and diverse career. I didn't even start really writing until 1990 when I started writing for Hemmings. Uh, I tried a lot of different things. But before that, I've always owned automobiles and trucks, a lot of them that were manufactured long before I was born. And uh, at that time, I had I didn't have the money for restoration, but I, I they were dependable vehicles, and they were daily drivers, and they ranged from well, 1915 Dodge, 1942 Chevy trucks, uh, pickup trucks have been a big part of my life, and uh, the old pickups in the 40s and the 50s, well, I've covered many many miles with those things. Yeah, no doubt. I know from some of the photos you sent me, I think you love those old pickup trucks, which of course. Uh, us Americans here in the United States love pickup trucks. My goodness, you look at how many are on the road, how many are sold, and uh, what a pivotal part of people's lives they are. Not only just fun, but work uh, and so forth. My grandfather was a farmer and had many pickup trucks. And uh, I was always surprised my dad never ha- had one, though. Maybe that's why he escaped the farm, came out west. He was He was done with all that stuff. But I would love to know a little bit more about... What instigated your personal passion for being involved in cars and riding? Is there a pivotal moment in your life when you knew that you were, too, indeed, a car guy? Yeah, this all started. uh, I've always been an inquisitive person, and it was my grandfather. My father was born in 1928 in Jackson, Michigan. My my grandfather at that time was 63 years old, so I never met my grandfather. But there was a picture on the mantle at my grandmother's house of my grandfather and Henry Ford together at the house there on Hinckley Boulevard in Jackson, Michigan. And so I became intrigued by this. And as I started digging deeper, I found that there was a lot of patents in my grandfather's name, like for the coaster brake on the bicycle, that he'd been involved with. Uh, He'd been a machinist for David Buick when he was operating in Jackson. And uh, he was involved with uh, various endeavors, Hinckley and Myers, uh, specialty machine tools, Hinkley Engines in E-Course, Michigan, that produced truck engines in the teens. And so that opened the door uh, for my, my interest in automotive history. And I've, just, I've always found vintage vehicles to be time machines. You, 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 you climb into an old vehicle and you enter another era, and especially if you can put that vehicle on a road like Route 66, mm-hmm. it's the closest we'll ever get to time travel. Yeah, yeah, back to the future. You're right. I have had old cars in my past. And what I always said was when I pulled my string back gloves on, I had to kind of slow myself down a bit and go back to that moment in time and think a little bit before I turn the key and start driving. Because the cars are so different, so much slower, more dangerous in a sense that they don't stop as well as your modern cars. They don't accelerate onto a freeway as well. But as long as you get back into that mindset and you realize, okay, I'm in a different place. I don't need to expect what I get from my new modern car out of this old car. It's about the experience, the drive, and everything. It can be really, really delightful. Let's talk about some of the roads you've driven down and talk about a big challenge or a big failure you face because these are wonderful learning experiences, and they teach our listeners here on Cars Yeah a lot about well, how to get through some of these situations, because they very well may face the same thing. So walk us through one of yours, would you? Well, you know, life in itself is is all about overcoming challenges. It's just part of life. And failures is a big, uh, big part of life. It's it's just something we have to deal with. And I I have a very dark sense of humor sometimes, but the great ironies of life. And and one of these was with uh, one of the first books that I had published, The Big Book of Card Culture. And I, I have a tendency to, uh, I'm one of these people who don't read the instructions until, uh, <laughs> for example, I put together the bicycle on Christmas morning. And when the handlebars where the seat should go, I get out the instructions. <laughs> so I had, I had written a big book of car culture. It had done fairly well, uh, received the bronze medal at the International Automotive Media Awards. Nice. But it hadn't sold well. I, I had not done my homework, and I didn't understand my role in marketing and selling the book. After a year of sluggish sales, I literally stumbled into an interview with Jay Leno at Jay Leno's garage for the book. And as it turns out, uh, I was all excited, called the publisher, explained that I know sales had been slow, but now I found Willy Wonka's golden ticket. (laughs) We're going to put this book on the map. And the publisher says, gosh, that's a shame. Two weeks ago, we decided not to reprint, and we're remanding the books to Sam's Club. 
What? Oh, no. <laughs> the golden ticket fluttered into the wind there a little bit, didn't it? It did. But, yeah. you know, it opened other doors, and we, yeah. we, we learned from that. I learned how to better promote myself, my books. Started a relationship with um, with Mr. Leno, and, you know, we, we did dust ourselves and go on. It's, it's, yeah. it's just that yeah. example. Well, thanks for sharing that story. Kudos to you for getting on Jay Leno's Garage. I've been trying to get Jay on this show forever. I'm going to land him one of these days. He's a, a very busy guy, and I'm sure he doesn't need me, but I would sure love to have him on because I admire him so much just because of the true blue car guy he is. But what little piece of advice might you offer a future author here? Because I've had hundreds of authors on this show, and one of the things I seem to hear over and over again is, they're great at writing. They're great at collaborating with a team to put a beautiful book together, but they're not so good at marketing it. They, that's not their prowess. It's, it's out of their comfort zone. They don't really know how to do it. And the people that do know how to do that really well, especially in social media, really succeed greatly even when their books aren't good. So what little piece of advice or a little golden nugget would you drop for some uh, authors that are trying to put some books together out there on how they could be more successful? I still, that's one of my, that's my Achilles heel. I have trouble mm -hmm. marketing myself and my books. But in the modern era, you can be so creative and do so many different things. Uh, I launched a Facebook Live program, a, couple, a weekly Facebook Live program on Jim Hinckley's America uh, about a year ago. Uh, just to see how this worked, uh, because I, I, I tease people a lot that I'm modern Amish. I have trouble <laughs> with any technology after the Model A Ford. But this became an intriguing program, and I started taking it on the road, interviewing interesting people, and using that as a gateway to plug my books and sell my books. And it's worked, you know, it's worked fairly well. Mm -hmm. And what surprises me, the audience sometimes is fifteen to 15,000 people a week wow. on this little uh, Mayberry television type program that I do with a cell phone and a couple yeah. little microphones. Yeah, well, tremendous. I think the the real key I get here on the takeaway is try something new and different. And also, what I suggest to people is look at what other people who are successful are doing and don't reinvent the wheel. Just do what they're doing. Uh, if they're doing sure. like you, Jim, they're doing a Facebook Live, give it a try. You're going to stumble. You're going to look goofy at first, but who really cares? Because in today's uh, short-term memory, people don't remember what they read this or saw this morning because they're on to something else in the afternoon. So. Don't worry about that. Just get out there and do it. Just like Jim did. Uh, you know, he took his Model A and his uh, Model A telephone and wound it up and created a Facebook Live. So I think that's tremendous. That's very, very great. Well, let's shift gears and go to the other end of the spectrum. I'd love for you to share what I call kind of a career aha moment when uh, those headlights kind of steer you down another journey, another path, another roadway. Is there one of those in your uh, your life you could share? Yeah, I, I, I wrote uh, automotive history and vehicles have been a passion of mine for a long, long time. But I had trouble uh, finding a, a market, if you will, because I always wrote about obscure things. I, I, for example, I wrote a book on the Checkered Cab Manufacturing Company. Jay Leno said he had to be one of the five people that bought the book. Uh, <laughs> it, it, but but I, I started finding that uh, there was a great interest, for example, in Route 66, and I've spent most of my life traveling. And Route 66 has been a big part of my life uh, from 1959 forward. So I, I kind of changed focus. I started writing about Route 66 uh, and other U.S. highways and using that as a backdoor to, to pushing my automotive writing. For mm -hmm. example, I was in uh, Jackson, Mich Michigan with Ted O'Dell um, at a fundraiser for the Hackett Automobile Museum. And by, by speaking about the infancy of the American auto industry, this wild time when cities like St. Louis had 114 automobile manufacturers, I could lead up to and sell the idea of Route 66 and, and uh, how, how much fun it is, how important it is to the evolution of the automobile, and, um, and then point the way to some of the books I've written. Very cool. I love it. And a shout out to Ted O'Dell, uh, who you mentioned, founder and executive director of the Hackett Auto Museum. He was my uh, guest number 971 back in February earlier this year. So, Ted, thanks for connecting me with Jim here. That's how uh, all of us car folks connect is through uh, references and, and people hooking us up with great people who love cars and are very inspirational. Let's have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special car or truck, since you mentioned trucks. 
Is there a very first one that you got back in your memory banks that uh, you could share with us? Yes. One more point I would like to add is what you just were talking about with Ted O'Dell. One of the keys to being a successful writer is networking. Sometimes the writer is going to find out that there's no money in the writing itself, but what it leads to, presentations, speaking engagements, things of that nature. As to my as to my special vehicle, it would probably be uh, one I wished I hadn't let go of is 1946 GMC. I had that for many, many years, and it played a very special role in, in a, a lot of aspects of my life. It was the cl- closing years of my John Wayne period when I was still working on ranches. Uh, it was the vehicle I had when my wife and I started courting. It was a vehicle that kind of uh, renewed my passion for Route 66 because I would drive into Kingman on weekends, and of course, a 1946 GMC is not conducive to freeway use. So I had to use an alternate route, which was Route 66. Yeah, yeah. You know, those trucks are really cool. I like those trucks a lot. I like the way the headlights kind of come off the front fenders. Reminds me, you may laugh at this, as old MGTC, when the TC started integrating the headlights into the fender, kind of. You know, they're they like bullets coming off the fenders. And, and that beautiful big double grill, the big one on the bottom and the little one at the top, I mean, just... There's some really cool elements with that truck, so I can see why you would miss that truck very much. What color was yours? It was junkyard camouflage. You could park <laughs> it in any junkyard and no one would find it. Uh, there was no paint. It was desert sunburn, but it was uh, – those old trucks, the Chevys and the GMCs, all the way up through the early 50s. Uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, they've got that old 411 rear axle ratio. They're a little slow. Mm -hmm. But they are probably some of the most durable and dependable trucks that have ever been manufactured. Yeah, built for farm work. And that's what they were for. They were great. Well, that's a a very, very cool truck. I can see how you'd want one of those again. Well, is that your seller's remorse story? Is there, or is there another car in your life uh, that, or truck that you really wish you had back? Oh, I've got dozens and dozens over the years that I I kick myself on. I had a chance uh, one time back in the early 70s to buy a one owner early 60s Lincoln uh, Continental Convertible, the four-door model. It needed a water pump, and uh, it was only $200. It had been garage kept. But instead, I bought a 1942 Chevrolet pickup truck. I've turned down, and I've had a chance, uh, and some of the vehicles I've owned uh, or gotten rid of or wish I had again. I had a, I had a really nice one-owner 56 Ford pickup with a 292 V8 uh, factory ford matic transmission and power steering with nice. a wraparound back window, tinted glass, fully deluxe loaded truck. Not something you see every day. No. So I've, no. I've had quite a few of those. I've had, I've had dozens and dozens of vehicles that I, boy, I just wonder. Have you ever counted them all? You know, I, I haven't. But uh, when it comes to like trucks, the, the advanced design series, 48 to 53 Chevys probably went out. I've had all oh, dozens of those trucks over the years, panel trucks, pickup trucks, flatbeds. Wow. Lots of cars have passed your hands. Very cool. Fun to have all those experiences. Well, what are you working on these days that has you excited and really fired up? Well, uh, right now I just sold my 68 Dodge pickup to a fella in uh, St. Louis. And uh, don't really have much going right now. I'm, uh, I've got a 98 uh, Jeep Cherokee. I'm always... Like like a junk magnet. I just can't help it. Believe it or not, one of the vehicles that I've always wanted to own is a simple little Model A Ford pickup. I've never had a Model A Ford. I've had Model Ts, but never a Mm -hmm. Model A. And that's on my list. Of course, my list is about 200 vehicles long. I know. (laughs) I understand. My list has always been bigger than my wallet. That's for sure. It's always something else. And then you uh, go to events like I uh, just came back a few weeks ago from SEMA and you see a whole bunch of other cool cars. Oh, I'd like to have that. I'd like to have that. Or a car week at Pebble Beach or any of them. I mean, it's just it just keeps going on and on. I know it's a plague. Something that plagues us car people that don't have giant wallets for sure. And probably even ones that have giant wallets, they just want more. So uh, I think it's a never ending quest. Well, if you woke up tomorrow... Jim, and you were a car or a truck, you were actually manifested into a vehicle parked in the garage. What would you be and why? Oh, boy, that's a tough question. You know, I have always been fascinated with the first generation Hudson Super 6. Hmm. And I guess I would probably go with that in 1916, 17, 18. They were were, uh, simple, dependable, extremely durable. 
just a touch of styling and class there that you just didn't see in that period. Those cars, I'm thinking back, I mean, some of them were turned into race cars, you know, fenders taken off, and they were actually kind of cool because didn't the back end kind of drop off really quick? If I remember well, right, it was... Some, it, it, it depends on the body build. The Hudson Super 6, and I, I may have this off just by a little bit, but uh, I was, one of my first in dealings with the Super 6, I was doing some research on um, early engine configurations, F heads, L heads, and I stumbled on a story uh, from uh, 1916 about the Super 6, and I was astounded thinking of the road conditions. For example, in 1915, when Edsel Ford drove the National Old Trails Road, he made 100, in his diary, he notes driving 150 miles in one day and that it was a good day's run. Mm. <laughs> well, this Hudson Super 6, they drove one from New York City to San Francisco in five and a half days without mechanical failure. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, that's, that's an astounding accomplishment, when you can, especially when you consider the roads. Even today's standards, trying to drive a car from New York to San Francisco in five days is pretty astounding. But over the roads they had then, it's just nothing short of amazing. You know, uh, R.M. Sotheby's sold a beautiful 1916 Hudson Series H, I believe it was, Super 6, that was a race car. And it actually had been, I think it might have been turned into a race car, and it won the great race uh, when they ran it back in 2000, that event that runs across the country. Um, and it was just a cool-looking car. And, and as I remember, it was white, but what stood out was the proportions of it. It, it, was, it was old, which means it was a big car. But not really. It was it was just like almost scaled down a little bit. There was just something about the proportions that caught my eye that I thought were pretty cool. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of different variations of that car. When I think back and, and the back end of this particular car was like a bullet, came to almost a point, uh, which is really cool as well. So I think that's the most one of the most unique answers I've gotten to that question here, Jim. So I think that's pretty cool. Well, good. Very good. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things and unique is one of them. Well, unique and inspirational. I think those are two great definitions for Jim uh, Hinkley here on Cars. Yeah. Well, Jim, up next is the last lap. But before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. Hey, Cars Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Covercraft. I've protected my vehicles with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft seat covers. They'll protect your seats from the daily abuse of pets, children, weekend adventures, and even those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. All Covercraft seat covers are easy-on, easy-off design that are machine washable. You can choose from many fabric options, colors, and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicles. Their seat gloves are semi-custom fit for cars and trucks, and their seat savers, a favorite of mine, are custom-tailored to fit your seats like a glove. Work truck seat covers are tough, durable, denim weight fabric. It's like putting a pair of rugged jeans on your truck's seats. Want to stay warm? Covercraft also offers seat heaters. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. What's every automotive enthusiast dream? To design and build that perfect garage. My friends at Metron Garage are a group of creative talents who've combined their passion for cars with their careers in architecture. Their service includes unique garage design and state-of-the-art fabrication. They will create the coolest custom garage for you and your vehicles. Metron Garage's system features fully engineered commercial-grade material and structural framing that's stronger than traditional construction. Their designs are pre-engineered to meet your building codes for fast, bolt-together construction. With over 25 years of experience, you'll see a 3D rendering to visualize your custom garage, and the final structure will fulfill all your storage needs. Contact Metron Garage today and begin realizing your dream garage. Go to metrongarage.com. That's metrongarage.com. Garages built for discerning enthusiasts. Where it's not just a garage, it's where your dream garage comes true. Okay, Jim, we are back and we're entering the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? This is going to really upset Ford people. Okay. But uh, <laughs> years ago, I was uh, looking at buying a 1940 Lincoln convertible. 
And I hold, had an old mechanic tell me that uh, the best thing you can ever do is avoid pre-war Fords in the 30s. He said, the only way you can surely stop them is aiming them at a brick wall. Ouch. Uh, the the, <laughs> the, the, the uh, braking left a bit to be desired on the old Fords, I'm afraid, in those years. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because of all like the deuce coupes that were created into hot rods, which were designed to go fast. Maybe they weren't designed to stop fast, though. But uh, those uh, 30s Fords were uh, very, very popular, continue to be so today. But I think they were all highly modified when they were put into that configuration. Uh, would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? Perseverance and dedication. Uh, not having enough sense to just quit. You just keep <laughs> pushing forward. Yeah. I think a lot of things take that, but uh, yeah, that definitely gets you through. Now, there are a lot of great resources for us these days. Is there one in particular you'd like to share? Yeah, boy, there's a bunch. Um, Facebook is a tremendous uh, tool if it's used right. Mm -hmm. uh, the AAC, a, AACA maintains a really great page. A page that I'm obsessed with on there is Abandoned and Neglected Vehicles. It's a fascinating resource of things people are pulling out of barns, people are finding, people are looking for parts for, or people are selling. Very cool. Great. Those are two that I will check out. If I could wave a magic wand and arrange for you to have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would that be? Uh, Ralph Teeter. Oh, you're the first one to mention him. Well, tell us about Ralph. Well, Ralph is a fascinating fellow. He's credited with the invention of cruise control. He patented the first practical application for uh, torque converter automatic transmission back in the mm -hmm. 1920s. Wow. And uh, he is a um, perfect circle piston ring company was one of his little creations. And at one point, over 90% of the car companies and airplane trains all use perfect circle piston rings. He was involved with all kinds of different things, but one of the most astounding things about Mr. Teeter, he was involved in an accident as a child in his father's machine shop, and he was blind. Yeah, incredible. To stop and think about that for a minute, and then think about what he achieved is pretty outstanding. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Love it. Well, how about a book? Is there a book that you've read or a book that you've authored that you think our listeners should get their hands on? Boy, that's a... That's a that is tough. I have such a library here. I have I have been very privileged. I have everything on my shelf here from an original copy of Emily Post, 1916 book by Motor to the Golden Gate and uh, Edsel Ford's Travel Journal from 1915. Probably one of the greatest books ever done was the uh, Encyclopedia of American Cars. I believe it was from 1805 to 1945 that uh, was done back oh, many years ago, by uh, published by Old Cars Weekly. But it's encyclopedic work that I don't know how they did it in the pre-interstate era. I just have no clue. But it's an amazing resource. Sounds like it. Fantastic. Well, I'll remind our listeners you can find links to these resources on Jim's show notes page on the Cars yeah! website. Just type Jim Hinkley into the search bar, and that page will pop right up with all those links. And speaking of books, there's a great place on the Cars Out website called Guest Recommended Books, where there are way over a thousand books listed there with quick, easy links to buy. It's a wonderful resource if you love automotive books or business books, inspirational books. Lots of great reading there by my inspiring automotive enthusiasts. All right, Jim, we're up to the checkered flag, and this last question could be a bit of a doozy. Today, I'm going to buy you any cool collector car or truck on the planet. Doesn't matter who owns it or where it is, I'm going to get my hands on it and park it in your garage, but there's a couple rules to this game. One is you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other cars with. The second is you have to drive it and enjoy it. And the third is it's the only one you can have. So what's it going to be? Well, I guess I'll have to go for the 49 Nash. Oh, wow. Okay. And what is it about the 49 Nash that you like so much? Just about everything. <laughs> I love the unique manifold head configuration. I love the Unipod Dash. I like the unique styling. Uh, I like the fact that it's dependable, fuel efficient. I just like the car. You know, those cars, you may not like the way I'm going to describe this, but I think them as like a big cockroach. They're very sleek. And I mean that in a very nice way, but they are very different for cars of that era, uh, in my opinion. I mean, the design elements, um, very, very different kind of looking cars. Um, Heavy, kind of bulky looking, but there's a sense of elegance, too, that kind of plays off of those things. So 
Interesting. I think you're the only one that's chosen that uh, out of 1,171 people. That's the great thing about that that uh, question. What color would you like yours to be? You know, I'm not really particular. Uh, as I mentioned with my 46 GMC, I haven't had a lot of collector cars that had paint. They were all dependable and trustworthy, but most of them had uh, suffered from junkyard camouflage. So uh, anything with paint would actually be kind of different and nice. Be kind of different. You know, there's a, a beautiful one that I was looking up. It was a couple of weeks ago. might have been a month ago. Somebody had mentioned that car. A 49 Nash Air Flight Ambassador, the two-door model. Yes. Oh, the Ambassador. Yeah. And it was a beautiful kind of a yellow color, um, light yellow color. Just, I don't know, white wall tires. It just made that car look very elegant, very cool. Um, so maybe I'll find you one in that color since paint doesn't seem to be an issue for you. Um, you I know. think that you'd look very nice in that. <laughs> And if we could do the three speed with overdrive, that would be preferable. I, Absolutely. Uh, like I'll make it. sure I'll make sure we get that option in there. Jim, you've taken me on a great ride today. I want to thank you for sharing your journey with the Cars Yeah listeners. Could you offer us a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that forty nine Nash? You know, uh, the best advice I can give someone is find something you enjoy and do it. I know you have to pay bills. And I know we all have to eat. On, uh, that's just that's a given. But the best thing I ever probably did was walk off of a steady job and decide to chase what I'm doing full time. Mm. And uh, financially, it's been a challenge sometimes. But I have no regrets. Uh, I, I went to the second European Route 66 Festival in uh, the Czech Republic this year. Wow. I've done all kinds of amazing things I could never have done if I would have stuck with the illusion of security that comes with a nine-to-five job. You know, that is excellent advice. And you just said the right words, the illusion of security. So many people think if they work for a big company or a small company, but if they have a job, there's some kind of security there. In reality... There really isn't any more security. Uh, It might be a little easier, but it certainly is not as enjoyable as going out and doing what your passion tells you to do. What's the best way for people to follow along with you and learn more about what you're doing these days, Jim? Uh, Jim Hinckley's America. That's my website, my Facebook page. All my work is pretty much under Jim Hinckley's America. There you go. I'll make sure I put a link to that on Jim Shonro's page on the Cars Yow website. Check out what Jim is up to. What a great inspiration for somebody who's out doing what he loves and contributing to uh, to all this car fun that we all find so enjoyable. Jim, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your experiences with me and the listeners. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. This was great. You take care of your cars. But who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important, too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.